everybody. I'm Steve. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you today about a, about a serious topic, but I'm going to try to keep it a little light. We'll see how it goes towards the end. Um, this talk is lightheartedly titled Web Browsers Om Nom 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 Nom. Um, basically, uh, I want to talk to you today about the idea of the browser eating the operating system and what that means for us and the future of computing in general. Um, I also want to thank you for being here at this excellent conference. This is currently, I've been at a lot of Ruby conferences over the last couple of years, to say the least. Um, and this is my last talk that is actually slated in the near future. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, OK, so this is a hard reality that I think we all really need to acknowledge. Um, I think that we, uh, together, have failed non-programmers when it comes to computers. I've worked with a lot of people that um, are either new to programming or new to computers um, over the years. In the last couple of years, I've been doing educational work. And I think that we've been doing a great job at making tools for ourselves. But I think that we are projecting a little too much of what we want onto non-programmer people. So I started thinking about this problem because I started thinking about how basically all software is totally broken, right? So. Uh, when, when you start off learning, you're like, this is a wonderful world of excitement I can explore. Everything is great and magical. And then you learn a little bit more about it, and you're like, OK, this is actually really hard and difficult. But you know, there's smart people above me who are like doing great work, and I can trust them to be doing that. And then eventually, your heroes become your friends, and they tell you, like, no, that code you thought I knew how it worked? I have no idea how it works. I just try to make it work sometimes. right? So, after programming for a very long time, I've come to realize that no one knows what they're doing whatsoever. Um, and that's, that's fine. But it also means that um, we're pretty good at taking care of ourselves because we know our own needs, but not other people's. So when I was thinking about this idea of like, is all, is all of programming broken? Like, do we need to throw out von Neumann architecture and try something else? Like, have, are we that wrong? Are we this far off the path? Um, I started thinking about this because I got an iPad. Um, so. Basically, hit the, hit the down key instead of the over key. Even if you give tons of presentations, you can still screw up hitting an arrow key. Um, so a couple weeks ago in San Francisco, Tom Dale said this statement to me. And it, combined with my iPad, made me start thinking about this problem. So um, the thing I think historians will miss is that a web browser represents the first time we can download arbitrary executable code and not worry about fucking things up. Um, I apologize for my French. That's <laughs> Sorry. I had to get one like tender love level pun in here. Um, so, but I was thinking about this, and it sort of like stuck in the back of my brain, and I said, yeah, cool, Tom, and then just like, you know, changed the topic. But I've been thinking about this for the last couple weeks, and um, it's true, right? So previously, uh, people go and they download stuff off of the web, and they run it. And if it's an EXE, they're probably screwed, right? Like, the outlook is not very good. Um, I recently taught some high school kids how to program for six weeks in the summer in New York City. And we had previously done weekend workshops with those kids earlier in the school year. So I'd seen some of these kids in January or February. They came back over the summer. You would not believe the amount of malware that was on their computers. And like what literally one, one child had a computer where there was an ad displayed at the bottom of every single page that he visited on the web. And I was like, you haven't even thought about how to, how to try to remove this? Like this doesn't bother you? Um, nope. So, um, <laughs> so that's, that's unfortunate. But because JavaScript is in a sandboxed environment, we regularly download Turing complete programs without checking what they do. And we can definitely mess things up. Like I said, these said iframes that display ads and things like that. But we don't have to worry about JavaScript deleting all the files in our computer, right? There's not the kind of that level of nuclear breakdown. We don't have to worry about it um, if I visit a random website on my phone, of it grabbing a list of my contacts and sending a spam email to every single person that I have on my phone, right? So this sandboxing is really interesting. Um, and so um, I think that I mentally sort of tend towards extremes. So I kind of either want HTML 3.2 with no JavaScript or totally downloadable giant JavaScript binary blobs. And part of this talk is sort of about my own mental shifting from saying, like, I know that there's JavaScript thing is happening, but I really just want HTML 3.2, and now being sort of totally in the opposite direction. Um, so yeah, so I think Tom had a really good insight here. Um, so yeah, so my iPad the second part of this equation. Um, I started playing around with an iPad because I started playing a game on my iPhone that involved hitting things on the screen, and it was a little too small, so I figured it'd be easier on an iPad. Um, so you know, I started using one, and then I had this iPad lying around. So you know, I heard that iPads were good for browsing the web, so I started using it to browse the web. 
and then I installed a couple more apps, and then I realized that for non-programming tasks, I actually prefer using my iPad to a real computer. Um, even though I've been programming for 20 years, I know the details of computers intimately. It is a Unix system. I know this, right? Like, I'm super command line um, based. Um, I actually, for a summer, an entire summer in 11th grade, I did not run X um, at all. Uh, so I'm usually that guy. But in everyday tasks nowadays, I prefer iOS. And this really bothers me um, because while I've been a lifelong Apple fan, um, I Apple's path towards achieving the same safety that JavaScript provides us with its sandbox model is through um, essentially like fascism, right? So uh, that's kind of not great. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, I, I now run Linux as a primary operating system, um, and this is sort of a, a triumph of the open web is that my uh, computer, the, this is the first presentation that my computer was not able to talk to the monitor. So because I use HTML and CSS for my slides, it did not matter whether I ran it on a Linux machine or on a Mac, so I was able to just load it up on someone else's computer, and it works, because I did not use something like Keynote, right? If I'd used Keynote and my Mac died, like, no way I could use a different computer, right? So open standards and openness are super important. But this model of computing is significantly better um, in my mind. So I started thinking about this, too. Um, my, my family has always been very computer savvy. Basically, when I was a child, it went, my, grand, my uncle would get a new computer, he would give it to my grandparents, who would give their old computer to my parents, who would give it to me, right? So I got like four generations of hardware removed. Um, but my grandparents always used computers. And like I said, we're lifelong Mac people, but at some point, my parents wanted a new computer, and I just built them a $300 Linux box with Ubuntu and put you know, Firefox on it. And I said, you've already been using Firefox. Some of the things are going to look a little funny, but like basically, this is the same computer, but it costs $300 instead of $2,500. And my parents used Ubuntu successfully for a very long time. Um, as you'll notice, this is not Ubuntu. This is you know, Windows. But Firefox basically looks the same on every platform. right? So they were able to shift the underlying, like they did not care what the operating system was, they only cared what their browser was, because by now we've been shifting all of our computing into the browser. And so, you know, I'm like shifting all these different pieces into place, right? And at some point in the last couple of weeks, this kind of fell into my head. I have one other fun story about um, my family and computing. So um, the, the meme of like, this is so easy, your mom could use it, is generally harmful. Um, but there's a related thing I think that's really important, that the missing, we're missing something from that meme. So this is uh, Microsoft Word 5.1 um, for Mac back in the day. And uh, my mom did secretarial work. So one of the things she used the computer was was for Microsoft Word. And um, I remember this coming out and using it and being super psyched about it. Um, but then you know, I heard Word 6.1 was coming out. And so I like, demanded that we upgrade the family computer to Word 6.0.1 because it was like the new shiny hotness. right? Like, Screw that Word 5 stuff. We're on Word 6. I'm like so excited. There's new things. And um, after I upgraded it, my mom made me un-upgrade it, um, and basically immediately. And if you were around in these days, uh, basically the difference between Word 5.1 and 6.1, or well, 6.0, was that this is 5.1, and this is 6.0. Um, <laughs> And so at the time, I was like, whatever. You know, there's a ton of features, but they're all useful. And there's just so much stuff. And I can do so many things. Like, I'm really excited. Why wouldn't you want these features? What's going on? This is stupid. And years later, I like to joke that this is the only argument from my childhood that I think that my mom was actually right and I was wrong. Um, <laughs> but I think that this is a distinction here that's important. So most of the time, we would see something like this. And we would say, uh, this is too complicated for new people because they're dumb. My mother was not dumb. She just had a low tolerance for bullshit. And most of the stuff that we add to programs are not actually necessary and are totally draw take you away from you trying to actually do something with a computer, instead fiddling with all these menus. So when I think back to it um, and how we're moving everything to the browser and most things are in the browser, I think there is a future in which um, this kind of model is a little more interesting. Um, and since you can download arbitrary safe JavaScript programs, what would happen if we had an operating system that literally was nothing but the browser? Um, so for the purpose of this talk, Chrome OS does exist, but um, it's not great and it's not there yet. So I'm sort of talking about a future of which Chrome OS might be one of those things. But since Google really needs to hurry up and die already, I'm hoping it's not Chrome OS. Um, but that's, that's something else. Google is the, the biggest threat to a free and open web, just so you all know. Um, I'm, I know they give you free email, so you love them, but like, they're, they're worse than Microsoft ever was. Um, Anyway, then we'll just put that. I only have 20 minutes, so I can't substantiate this comment. Sorry. Um, so 
So web standards now. So here's the thing. If we want, if we want browsers to be, replace the operating system, we need to give browsers more capabilities. The problem is, is that the way that we currently develop the web platform um, is not really conducive towards adding these abilities in a way that's useful, right? So let me describe to you the way that the web standardization process works right now if you don't happen to know. I'm a really big standards nerd, so I love these kinds of things. Um, so if you didn't know how standards work, I'm about to, I'm about to share it with you. Um, here's how it works. Um, a browser vendor, who's someone who programs in C++ all day on Firefox, decides that they want to implement some sort of new feature for browsers. So they implement that feature natively in the browser, and then their boss's boss's boss says, like, we should send that to the W3C to be you know, a spec, because we're playing nice with everyone in the industry. So they go through a W3C specification. Everyone argues over email for like, months on end. Um, we develop tools that generate 36 different browser prefixes so that we can do all the slightly different incompatible versions that other people implement. Um, and then finally, it becomes standardized. We remove the prefixes. Everybody has one feature. It's finely designed. It's perfect. Every browser supports it. And then we write a JavaScript shim on top of it because we don't actually want to use the thing they implemented. We want to use something that's sort of like it, but better. Um, so yeah, that's sort of where we're at. Um, and there's some downsides to this model you can't tell by my thinly veiled sarcasm. Um, basically, the big ones are that the people who write C++ on Firefox do not build websites. They write C++ for Firefox. So they don't know what our needs are. Remember this like from before? Like We don't know what normal people need necessarily, normal people, uh, non-programmers. And uh, browser vendors don't necessarily know what we need when we're building web apps. Um, this process takes forever. This is a positive thing as well as a negative thing. Um, there's no feedback in the process from any of us. How many of you are subscribed to the W3C, HTML5, and Watt WG, HTML5 mailing list groups? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so there's no feedback to them whatsoever. So they're just operating completely blindly as to our needs because we don't tell them what our needs are. And there's also spotty support. Like if you paid attention during Constantine's talk, right? Like here's, oh, this browser version doesn't so totally support this. And this Flash plugin is totally screwed and like everything is terrible. Um, so we have to paper over these things with shims, right? Like HTML5, shiv, and all those things that like paper over weird browser support for stuff. So there's lots of problems. However, I think that everyone is kind of getting their collective stuff together, and we're building towards a future that is much, much better, and I'd like to share it with you. Um, because I only recently became aware of this, and I'm a, generally a standards nerd. Um, so what would a web standards process look like that was actually workable and usable? Um, I think it would look like this. So we build new features for the browser in JavaScript. Okay? Then from that, once we have a feature that we're happy with, we submit that to the W3C for specifications. And then after it becomes specified, the browser vendors implement this natively. So what's cool about this is it inverts this power structure. right? We drive the standards process rather than the browser vendors. They don't have to imagine features anymore. And you get a polyfill on day one. So um, this is kind of neat. Um, and if that sounds kind of weird, uh, well, the downside before I get into that, the downside is that browsers don't currently have the extension points that allow us to write new features for browsers in JavaScript. So I'm going to talk about um, what that kind of stuff uh, looks like. Um, yeah. So extending browsers, like how do we get that extra support um, in our browsers? So uh, Constantine mentioned content security policy header earlier. Uh, since he just mentioned the words content security policy header. Um, this is an example of one. It is incredibly tiny. I apologize for the font, uh, the code font here. Basically, it just says content security policy, uh, default source self, and then ajax.googleapis.com. So this will only run JavaScript that runs on your own domain or from ajax.googleapis.com, which basically means that like, cross-site scripting attacks go away. People can't inject uh, JavaScript from elsewhere. It helps improve security. So this was, this was a, a feature that has been standardized, and many browsers now support it. But if we had done it the way that I'm dreaming of instead of the way that uh, we did it, you could actually write this feature in JavaScript, right? So you could imagine a world in which a browser exposes a hook that can read headers, and then you could write a JavaScript function that basically returns true if you want the request to succeed and false if you want it to fail. So you could implement much more interesting rules than just like what is the core domain that it comes from, right? You could build whatever you want. It's Turing complete. Um, and so uh, that is something that is sort of being talked about for the next iteration of the content security policy header. But imagine if like, jQuery was a polyfill, right? So sort of what I'm describing is what happened with jQuery. Hey, selectors are really freaking terrible. Let's write our own in JavaScript. So what would happen if instead now browser vendors implemented jQuery natively in the browser, and then jQuery became a shim to see, does your browser support jQuery? Yes or no? If yes. 
use the native version. If no, use the one that we're all using today. This could actually decrease like, transfer times. It would mean they're faster because it would be implemented in lower level languages, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's sort of like uh, doing these kind of things. And one other related idea that we definitely need to make this sort of future of an, uh, a browser work, and since I have 20 minutes, I cannot expand on this super further, um, other than to say Chrome's implementation of this idea is terrible. Um, apps in your browser, um, there is very little to like our programmer brain, there's a super big distinction between installing an application and bookmarking a web page. But you could imagine a world where instead of your browser showing the last nine websites you visit, it instead had a list of iOS-like icons of web apps you have installed to your browser, aka bookmarked, and pre-cached and downloaded all the assets. And that would mean we'd have an iOS-like interface, but we'd still be implementing them as web applications. But to normal people, um, it would be a much better like, workflow and UI and et cetera. And since all these things are sandboxed, you basically get iOS, but on a free and open platform, the web, which we all know and love, as opposed to a ridiculous closed platform owned by one company that has more money than ExxonMobil. Um, so, Rails. Uh, yeah. OK, so um, where does this leave us as Ruby programmers, right? So I am standing here in front of you. I literally have Ruby tattooed on my body. Um, I love Ruby, uh, and a Pearl Camel as well. Um, I love Ruby as much as everyone else does. So where does this kind of lead us? Um, and so in this sort of future world that exists, we are writing JavaScript front end applications with Rails server backends. Um, this means that Rails is mostly just an API server. It is not generating HTML. Um, nobody really argues that we don't need to write any JavaScript. The question is framing how we write our JavaScript, right? So uh, Basecamp has one megabyte of sprinkles on top of it. Um, just to get, the, you know, we don't write a whole lot of JavaScript. It's just sprinkles. There's a megabyte. Like, I, I don't understand. TurboLynx turns every single web application into a single page application. That's what it does. Like, you are now running a JavaScript SPA. Um, so the question is how we do, do this kind of thing. So if you're building a Rails app today, uh, and if I would be building a Rails app today, which I am building a couple now that I don't have a job, hoo-hoo, um, <laughs> my friends are all confused. They're like, wait, I thought you quit your job. Why are you going to Israel and then Budapest and then Paris and then Sweden? And I was like, sorry. Um, so, uh, so using Rails API, the gem, like, is basically like I consider Rails API to be more Rails than Rails at this point, or more like what Rails um, is. The JSON API format that Yehud and I standardized um, and are in the process of going through the standards um, process is useful for writing these kinds of applications because it helps separate things between your front end and your back end. Basically, it prevents bike shedding. So if you've ever argued about whether something should be plural or an array or a hash or whatever, like, just use JSON API and stop. Do something productive. Um, I, like, I love to bike shed as much as everyone else, but um, it's bad. Uh, if I was building a Rails app today, it would be half Ember, um, and only Ember. Uh, basically, uh, Ember has a very good path future towards this. I basically stole the CSP example straight from Yehuda's blog. So um, Ember sort of has a future where it is a browser extension and doesn't really exist anymore, um, in theory, if we can pull this all off. Um, so using Ember will prepare you for a future that looks like this. Um, and also, like, I think that we need a heavy dose of reality in the Ruby and Rails world. Um, we are no longer hip or cool or edgy or exciting. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying this is a problem. Um, it means that we're all going to have jobs forever because Rails is now the safe default choice. No one is like proclaiming from their rooftops, I just got funding for Y Combinator and I use Ruby on Rails. Like, that doesn't, that's not a thing, right? So. Um, this means that what we're doing is shifting a little bit, and that's totally fine, but we shouldn't be, like, we're still making fun of Java, like, 10 years later. Like, we should just get over it already. Um, Java's not actually that bad these days. Um, XML isn't super terrible. Like, don't define yourself by hating other things. Define yourself by building cool stuff. Um, so, yes, we need to, like, grow up and realize that we have to write JavaScript, and I'm telling you this because I also did not want to write any JavaScript until, like, a month ago when I finally said, okay, I finally need to just like be an adult and admit that I need to do things I don't want to do in life and write JavaScript. Um, so with that said, uh, I only have 15 more seconds of elaboration, so I can't substantiate any of this anymore. Uh, 
Um, so thank you for uh, listening to this. But seriously, though, like I'm joking, but I mean it very seriously. Like use Ember, build cool stuff, do awesome things, and like thank you so much for all the stuff you do and for coming and just like you guys are like my family. So thank you. <laughs>